Thank you so much, Mr. President. And as our president mentioned a few minutes ago, UNESCO has a new president of the General Assembly. She was elected less than a month ago at the General Assembly, the 36th General Assembly of UNESCO in Paris. So let me ask the podium, Her Excellency Katalin Bogyai, the president of the General Conference of UNESCO. Mr. Chairperson, Professor Guyash, thank you very much for giving me the floor. What an honor. Your Excellency, Mr. President of Hungary, Mr. Pan Schmidt, Your Excellency, the President of the Hungarian Academy, Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Standing here in the Hungarian Parliament and reflecting on the social and ethical responsibility of science, I would like to dedicate my closing remarks to an outstanding Hungarian scientist who presided over the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and served as a member of the parliament. A poet and a painter, he embodied the idea of a socially oriented and publicly conscious scientist. The 36th session of UNESCO's General Conference under my presidency has just decided that next year, UNESCO will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the birth of Janos Szentágotai. <laughs> One of the creative and renowned neurobiologists of the 20th century, a towering intellectual and a great humanist. His vision of the brain as a network of specific populations of nerve cells, cells, each engaging in selective functions like the bolts and wheels of machines and self-organizing into modules, has provided the framework and stimulus for generations of neuroscientists. His curiosity and passion for the beauty in the workings of the brain never faded. All who passed through his door were greeted by the question, now then, what's new, what's up? He was born here in Budapest in 1912 and died in Budapest in 1994. In one of his papers, Too Much and Too Soon, published in 1982, he wrote, no speculation can remove our responsibility for our actions and behavior. He was deeply concerned with and actively worked to avoid the, as he said, abyss of an atomic holocaust, as well as the destruction of natural environment. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, your insightful contributions throughout this conference have revealed an inconvertible reality, an unprecedented expansion of the scientific landscape into new frontiers of knowledge, turning yesterday's dreams into today's realities at an ever-increasing rate. Science, driven by the curiosity of human beings to know the universe and to understand their place in it, is spreading new knowledge rapidly around the globe to sustain cutting-edge research conducted at universities, laboratories, and academies of sciences scattered around the world. Improved access to new information communication technology has brought scientists, you ladies and gentlemen, working in distant corners of the Earth closer together. And with the immense power of science came an equally great ethical responsibility to do no harm. For us at UNESCO, as my dear friend, Madame Gretchen Kalonji, the ADG for Science, already said, the international scientific cooperation that is taking place for peaceful purposes is the cause for optimism. But this optimism is not unconditional. 
We understand, in no uncertain terms, the need for science to serve humanity and not to threaten it. UNESCO was born out of the ashes of unprecedented destruction, both material and human, made possible and fueled by new scientific knowledge. The double-edged potential to harm and benefit humankind is inherent to science and will become only more relevant with future advancements. Humanity today expects ethics to guide science towards meeting its broader needs and promoting the overall well-being. This is our fundamental mandate at UNESCO through its pioneering role as a standard setter and catalyst for international cooperation in the ethics of science. UNESCO has contributed to a global framework that prevents misuse of new scientific knowledge and promotes sharing of benefits for all persons, regardless of race, color, gender, nationality, religion, or any other criteria. Today, the international community turns to scientists for answers to some of the most pressing social, economic, and environmental problems that transcend national boundaries. Whether it is urgent task of halting climate change and acute need to provide basic health care for large parts of the world's population or the shared responsibility to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, the science of the 21st century is expected to point to the effective solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussions during the forum shed the light on a new global trends that exert pressures on scientific enterprises and affects the relationship between ethics and science in the 21st century. The expectations of high profitability associated with cutting edge innovations, especially in the life sciences, influence the ordering of scientific research priorities based on commercial considerations, often neglected the real needs of the world's people. Albert Einstein cautioned us that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. This notion forms a foundation for the Budapest World Science Forum, which now for over a decade has brought together stakeholders of knowledge around the world. Renowned and young scientists, science policymakers, and the general public in order to engage in collective and innovative reflection about ways to translate the fruits of scientific progress into benefits for humans and their societies based on universally recognized ethical principles. The product of a truly innovative collaboration between the key international stakeholders in science, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, UNESCO, ICSU, AAAS, TWAS, the European Academy of Sciences, Advisory Council, the Budapest World Science Forum has come through a journey that began in 1999. I remember I was here, and so many of you I remember, with the UNESCO World Conference of Science held in Budapest, which was presided at that time by Professor Hamori, who is now the president of the Hungarian National Commission of UNESCO. I'm very happy to welcome him. Now, as the fifth forum draws to a close, it is beyond and any doubt that the journey has been a rewarding one, turning this enterprise into a truly unique interface between scientists, policymakers, and other stakeholders. I'm delighted that this journey will continue on an international arena as the event will be organized in a partner country every other biennium, starting with Brazil, in 1913, uh, 2000, 2013. <laughs> Sorry. This 
I'm confident will further solidify the truly international nature of the forum, help achieve its greater visibility, and proliferate globally its achievements. I would like to thank the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and personally its president, Mr. Jacob Pallis, as well as His Excellency Mr. Aloisio Mercadante, Minister of Science and Technology of Brazil, for welcoming the forum. And I have to tell you, I had the chance to talk to the president of Brazil during the general conference, and I told her, please look after our baby. And she promised you will do it. And then, of course, the baby comes back and then goes away again, grown-up children. UNESCO preserving commitment to promote scientific cooperation as a vehicle towards lasting peace reflects its profound agenda. This commitment is the people-centered development paradigm that guides the work of the organization and challenges us to address one of the central questions raised by globalization today. How can we harness the power of scientific progress for the benefit of vulnerable persons and communities at a time of increasing complexity of social and economic problems? The World Science Forum will continue to provide the multidisciplinary platform for discussion and reflection on this critical question. For me, the real essence of our gathering is captured in Albert Einstein's remark that peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. And let me remember another sentence of Albert Einstein. He also said, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. I get most joy in life out of music. I would like to thank the organizers of the forum and personally, Professor Palinkash, for making sure that wonderful music was our frequent companion during these incredible four days. UNESCO's General Conference also decided that next year we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of another great Hungarian. He was Scholti György, or Sir Georg Scholti, who was also a tonge champion of peace amongst people. The World Orchestra for Peace that he established in 1995 was an inspiration to the leaders and politicians on the endless possibilities of peace through international cooperation. We are building peace at UNESCO. I'm wearing this beautiful brooch designed by one of UNESCO artists of peace, Ms. Hedva Swear. It's called the Tree of Peace. And I'm very happy to welcome Hungary's UNESCO artist for peace, Marta Sebastian, the great folk singer who is helping to build peace in the world. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, The, in the general conference, during the general conference, I had the honor to meet Mr. Kapil Sibal. He's the Minister for Science and Technology and Earth Sciences of India, who gave me a book of his poems. I would like to finish my speech with his mantra for peace. I hope that this mantra stays with us as we go on our journey, reminding us of the fundamental questions behind our discussions, how to improve our world and ensure a peaceful future for our children through science. Mantra for peace. For survival in this violent world, the system needs reform. We must embrace nonviolence 
in all its different forms. Our violence with nature has brought negative returns, specter of global warming adding to our concerns. Terrorism is on the rise, funded on cults and hate. To deal with it effectively, we need to cogitate. Violent means breed violence, leave wounds and open scars. A route we have adopted will not take us too far. We need an open dialogue, allay unfunded fears, harp on universal values all religions hold so dear. Nonviolence, the only creed, would help us to survive. Winning of hearts is crucial for ending this terror drive. Your Excellencies, thank you very much for listening.